good morning in europe and good afternoon in india welcome to the session on global sync up to combat epidemic today we have a very powerful panel here i'm sure we will learn from each other how to get out of this mess how to get out of this pandemic but uh, before moving ahead i would request for a quick introduction i will start with mine i am dr navin nishal i am a serial entrepreneur uh, signus hospital is my first company it's a 10 hospital company i exited uh, from signus hospitals 6 uh, months back but before that i started another startup uh, called medo medo is a, a platform where we are aggregating clinics so we started uh, 22 months back and now we are the largest uh, clinic platform in 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 the country and i am also uh, one of the members at voice of healthcare yeah so this is about me uh mark would you would you go like okay Next. good morning good morning and good afternoon everybody my name is mark nopen i am um, a pulmonologist by training and i have worked for more than 20 years as an academic pulmonologist in several places in the world including brussels where we are now and since 2006 i am serving as the ceo of the university hospital uh, of the free university of brussels and hence as a pulmonologist and as a hospital manager i have quite a uh, a large view on what has happened uh, here in the country and in our hospital yeah so uh, i would like to add a few few uh, lines here mark and i have signed an mou between voice of healthcare and university hospital brussels to work together on certain initiatives our, our very first initiative is uh, hlm 2020 healthcare leadership and management program it's a kind of a, an executive education program for healthcare leaders and my friend professor john guttermuth from university hospital brussels will be spearheading this initiative thank you mark for uh, joining the panel steve over to you hi i'm uh, steve chick i'm from the us originally but i've been living in france for the last uh, almost 20 years i'm a professor of technology and operations management so i'm not a medical doctor i'm not a nurse i'm not a health professional uh but i've been doing a lot of work in operation strategy continuous improvement Uh, and business model innovation uh, in healthcare over a number of years, and I've done a fair bit of mathematical modeling for uh, epidemics, as well as for highly adaptive clinical trial design. Uh, yeah. So, leading the health management initiative at INSEAD. Yeah, Steve is an amazing person. He was my teacher at INSEAD when I was doing an executive education program there, innovating health for tomorrow. Uh, that was, uh, I mean. a fantastic program thank you steve for spearheading that program thank you for inviting me here today yeah over to you dr trehan uh just a second uh, sir oh, you are my... yeah it's now you are audible okay uh hi i'm dr naresh trehan i'm basically a cardiovascular surgeon uh i'm the chief cardiac surgeon at medanta the medicity which is a 1500 bed institution i also am the chairman and managing director of the same trained in new york and returned to india 30 years ago so i've had some flavor of of the things that are happening in new york because in new york university and bellevue hospitals are my uh, are my areas are my matters so anyway uh it's good to be on on the panel with such learned people i'm just a mere surgeon but i'll try to keep up Thank you, Dr. Trehan. Uh, I would uh, like to tell you about Dr. Trehan. He is an inspiration for doctors in India. Every doctor wants to become like him, but he is a kind of a benchmark never achieved by any doctor so far. Welcome to the session, Dr. Trehan. Thank you. So, Dr. Trehan, I will start with you. As you know, that in terms of uh, COVID-19, we are testing less in comparison to Western world. our figure is somewhere around 1500 per million population 
while Belgium is uh, more than 50,000 per million population, and some other countries even more. In India, uh, you know that cases are rising day by day, so are deaths. Sometimes I feel that uh, situation is out of control now. What's your opinion? Where do we stand in terms of a fight against this disease? What's the current scenario here? So, you know, the a company, a country which is so complex as India is, because as they always say, every 100 uh, kilometers, the language changes, that it was a formidable task to try to actually cope with, a, with an unseen enemy, unknown enemy, and what it's going to do to you. So, way, let it be the way it is, but the basic thing is that the government did some good things in the very beginning. And that was recognition of the fact that we do not have an infrastructure to deal with the onslaught which may come, which was happening in other countries. So the lockdown, having been there for the last 50 days, has helped us hugely to develop, gear up, and manufacture some of the stuff that we need to cope with this, with this pandemic. And right now we feel that we do have over 150,000 beds actually dedicated to COVID right now around the country. We have enough ventilators, we think, because they have been started to be manufactured in India and we have been part of the development and testing of these ventilators. So they seem to be quite adequate for what we need and they numerically also they can be ramped up and which is being done right now. And the other equipment that we require was PPEs and other stuff, which we, which we, uh, our garment industry actually repurposed themselves very quickly. So I'm, what I'm saying is that in the last 50 days, our preparation to deal with the onslaught is much better than it was when we started. Second thing is to answer your question of where are we? So if we see that with the amount, proportion of testing that we are doing and the uh, recognizing or reporting of cases, the fact is that now we've reached 80,000, okay? This is possibly one-fourth of what probably the reality is. This is what I would think because of the fact that we are not testing enough, and not only that, we are not testing in the far-off areas. There aren't labs in the villages. There are no labs in small little towns. So they, this is a formidable task for the government of India to try to cope with this suddenly. But anyway... Whatever it may be, I would say that we are following the trends that we see in some of the moderate countries. The death rates should, could be underreported because we don't test them at, at death. We don't know what they died from because we don't have the testing in the villages and stuff like that. So you're right that it is underestimated right now. But you can safely say it's three to four times what it would be. But it's all a theoretical discussion. Right now, we are in the middle of the fact that the 50 days are over, we have to now grapple with the fact, like we say, life versus livelihood, that we say we have to open up, in what measures do we open up. So there is a whole lot of work being done, how successful we will be, we don't know. Now, from my point of view, if the peak or the surge comes and in peaks and troughs, and the peaks are not very high, I think we as a country are able to cope with the situation going forward. One of the good things is that 85% of the people will have minor or no symptoms. That's what our record shows also. 15% out of those, only 2, 3, 4% may require to go into the ICU or in a, on a ventilator. So I think that if it comes, it spreads itself over a period of the next six months or so, we will be okay. If, unfortunately, it hits a peak like it did in New York or some of the other places, we will have a problem. So I think we just, I just keep saying, uh, you know, there was a, just for your entertainment, there was a priest in a, in a Shiv temple who's got the Shiv Lingam and he put a mask on it and he's praying that India will be delivered by Shiv, Lord Shiva. He will kill the virus because he is the universal killer of all this bad stuff. So we say, okay, maybe some of it will come true. And then wild, wild fact about BCG being also being very uh, extensively used as vaccine in India, 
may be giving some protection because we are looking at the Portugal experience and some of the other countries. So given all that, I think that we are in the deep end. We will see what comes our way. We have learned a lot of lessons from the rest of the world. That's our, the lucky part for India is that it has come relatively late in the cycle of the world. So we have hope of, of uh, uh, pharmaceuticals being developed against it. We have hope of plasma therapy. We have hope of vaccine coming in the next six months or something. So all these things are advantage India. Having that, I think I've brought you up to speed here. And let's see what our colleagues, esteemed colleagues, have to tell us about their part of the world. Yeah. So yeah, I, I agree with you, Dr. Trehan, that uh, uh, although we are being a little more optimistic and uh, we are a country of uh, young people, so maybe we, uh, we are doing better than other countries and the BCG factor uh, cannot be you know, overlooked. So this is very important thing that in India, every, every child born is you know, given BCG vaccine. So there are a couple of uh, points in our favor. Uh, Mark, uh, while you know, talking about Europe or Belgium, I keep chatting with a lot of my friends in Europe. I know cases are on decline, more patients are going out of hospitals than coming in. What do you think, what's the current status in Belgium? And how is your hospital uh, contributing towards this war against COVID-19? Yeah. Um, the current status is uh, relatively positive in the, in the sense that, as you mentioned, that the number of new cases, the number of new admissions to the hospitals is declining since a few weeks now, um, thanks to the effects of the lockdown of the society, actually. Um, and this was necessary. I think it's fair to say that uh, no single country was really prepared to tackle um, a, a pandemic uh, spread like we have seen. And it is like uh, Dr. Tehan said, it's, it's quite important where in the timeline your country was situated. In, in Europe, we have uh, had the case of Italy, which was actually the first country to be to have uh, to suffer a major hit, uh, followed by Spain and then uh, Belgium and, and France and a few other countries. So we had about a time lag of 10 to 14 days behind Italy. So we had a, a quite a good impressive of how your healthcare system could be overrun actually by the number of uh, the peak uh, of, of patients coming in. So within, um, five days or so, uh, the hospital capacity in Belgium in terms of ICU beds, medium care beds and reserved beds for COVID patients was actually doubled. And this is in a country where there are already relatively um, quite a high number of hospital beds. In, in, yeah. If you look at the USO ranking, after Germany and Austria, Belgium has the highest number of hospital beds in, in the USO ranking. So we already had quite a good capacity. And this has helped us because never in the epidemic, we had more than 60% um, uh, saturation of the, the new quotum of ICU beds. If we wouldn't have done anything about ICU beds, we would just have made it or just not. But now we had a little uh, spare capacity and uh, we are now in the, in the way of um, uh, downscaling the number of reserved beds and ICU beds in the hospitals. However, the, the death toll of the epidemic is uh, quite high in Belgium. And this is because of the way of how um, the registry is done. Actually, every confirmed but also suspicious case or possible case is included in COVID death. So it's an overestimation. And we just today had a report of our university where they did a, a thorough analysis of all the deaths. So what you should compare is the, the over death rate compared to the same months last year and the year before, et cetera. And there you see that uh, the, and then compare that with the number of positive tests. And then you see that you come somewhere in uh, way after the UK, uh, Italy and Spain, 
but uh, in the same uh, area as uh, compared to population as the south of Holland, for instance, or the northeastern part of France, which are also quite severely hit. So uh, in some rankings, uh, if you can call it a ranking, you see Belgium at the top uh, with the number of deaths per, uh, but this is because every death is counted and which is an overestimation actually. So, um, and the final thing that I would like to say, and it is also mentioned by Dr. Trehan, uh, the, the Av Belgium has a quite elderly population eh, as compared to India, certainly. Um, but uh, it was mainly in the, in the category of the 65 plus year old eh, uh, and the very old that we had a lot of casualties and fatalities. And actually the, the uh, case fatality rate, uh, at the age groups below 65 years uh, is less than 1%. So it's mainly the elderly part of the population which has been hit. And unfortunately, there was kind of a, a blind spot in the management of the government is the elderly care residence homes where there was relatively little protection uh, for staff and personnel. And uh, there we have seen in some of the residential uh, uh, buildings we have uh, had uh, buildings where there was a 30 to 50 percent fatality rate of all, all inhabitants, which was in, immensely dra dramatic. So there were quite hot spots and niches of uh, very high incidences of, of mortality in the very old. Uh, and this has, all, of course, skewed a little bit uh, the statistics. But uh, to summarize, on average, we are now scaling down in this country the, um, the government lockdown uh, measurements. So every week there is a, a little bit more freedom to circulate and businesses can go open and some schools can go open, etc. So um, this is the situation now in our country. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I understand that uh, now Europe is doing better and so is Belgium, but uh, I'm more worried about second peak. I mean, although uh, this uh, I mean, graph is flattening, but uh, we have to be, I mean, well prepared for second peak as well, yeah. well in time. Ahead. So, uh, Steve, so this is something unprecedented. At least, you know, we can say that uh, we have never seen something like this in our lifetime. 100 years ago, there was a pandemic. And like COVID-19, we, we may encounter such pandemics in future as well. My question to you is simple and straight. With your vast experience in healthcare and advising a lot of large organizations across the globe, what models will work while there is always a risk of pandemic. So what are your thoughts yeah. on that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I think that's, that's a, a great question. Um, you know, and I, I think you're right. You know, we haven't seen something this ourselves, um, but you mentioned the 1918 uh, influenza uh, pandemic. That certainly was a big one. Um, we have seen uh, some other uh, incidents, though, in the not too distant past, we've had SARS, uh, Ebola is, is going, MERS uh, as well, the H1N1 um, outbreak. So we have seen similar types of phenomena. We've developed models, you know, the whole modeling community, the epidemiology community, um, uh, other communities as well, trying to model, you know, the, the spread of infection, how to control the infection. Um, certainly, this confluence of infectivity and uh, and mortality associated with this this one certainly puts it in a class of its own. Um, I think there are a lot of different models that one could uh, look to. Um, I think some models are just inappropriate uh, uh, and, and might misguide us. But I, I'm I am a big fan for for having a number of different models. Uh, why? Because having models helps us articulate our assumptions. So for example, Mark, you were just mentioning uh, that in, in Belgium, some of, the, some of the way of counting the cases was different than in some other countries. So as soon as we start to, to develop a model to describe the spread of infection, we have to then articulate, well, what are our assumptions and why? And, and so I think just that process, that, that dialogue, helps develop better policies for trying to, to intervene and, and, and mitigate 
uh, some of the consequences here. I think these, you know, we, we have learned from some of the risk models from, from the past though. Um, I think sometimes when we think about risk and how much, you know, how much do we spend and how much of the economy do we sacrifice uh, in order to, to help so many lives, uh, it sounds a bit uh, rude, but we have to think about, we have scarce resources. How do we use those, those resources most effectively to save as many lives uh, in, in a good way? Well, our usual models for doing that um, where we think, you know, somebody's exposed to a risk. Uh, there's a certain probability of a bad outcome as a function of that risk. And then there are certain consequences as a function of that risk. And how do our mitigation actions influence those probabilities? Uh, if we assume that those are independent from one person to another, which is our kind of standard way of, of thinking about things, uh, we end up with, with bad conclusions potentially. We have to account for the time sequence um, if I'm exposed first and then come into contact, then perhaps you become uh, exposed. But if I'm exposed after we, we uh, uh, connect to each other, then you're not at risk. So time is very important. There's correlation. This nonlinear time dynamics is very, very hard to conceptualize. Um, they're just thinking about in, you know, interest rates in a bank account and how compound interest works. It's very difficult to think about. It's not necessarily natural. And, and those are exacerbated with, with uh, epidemics and, and control. If there are multiple pathways by which a, a virus can be transmitted, um, if you block one, you spend a lot of money to block one, but you don't block the other, you may not get anywhere near the, the, the benefits that, that, that you're hoping to achieve. So if we have transmission through aerosolization and we have transmission through, say, uh, fomites like doorknobs, um, you know, we have to be able to control all of these things. So I think we have to take kind of a, a real systems point of view there. I think a lot of the models that we've been talking about um, in the press, um, you know, some of them are making somewhat different predictions, but now as we're getting more and more data, we're learning more and more about this particular bug. Um, and we're learning more about the, the, the population transmission effects, the lockdowns, um, we are, you know, getting, getting, getting some uh, better sense in there, at least as to the demand. You know, we talk about flattening the curve. That's a story about how much the demand will be for intensive care units, how much the demand will be for the vents, for the ECMO, uh, and so forth. Um, but we also have, I think it's useful to also be developing and thinking about models for how are we going to supply that capacity? So uh, whereas an epidemic model is about a story about demand, how do we get the supply chains there? How do we get the staff, the doctors, the nurses, the public health, the contact tracers? How do we get them engaged? How do we develop all those uh, people? How do we get supply chains for the PPE, the supply chains for producing um, additional ventilators where they're needed, for, for shipping them from one location to another if the demand is, 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 is going down for the beds here, but some other region could use them. How do we then uh, get all those systems in the background? So I think there's a, there's a great role for modeling of supply chains as well in this space. So we have an understanding of, of do we have the logistics in place to actually address uh, the, the needs that are required by this particular pandemic? So I, I think to summarize that, A, I think models are fantastic. They help us articulate assumptions. Two, they put things on a scientific basis. We can debate those assumptions. We can see what is the outcome as a function of changing those assumptions. For instance, we change how we measure or perhaps uh, Dr. Trahan is able to better inform us uh, uh, now than several weeks ago regarding the percentage of, of patients that will need to go to the ICU that might need a, a ventilator uh, or other care. As those, as those assumptions are, are improved, we're then able to be more scientific about the dialogue, especially in the context of this very nonlinear dynamic. And the final thing would be not only just modeling the demand, which is you know, the disease mitigation efforts affect the demand on these health resources, but also the supply chains that, uh, that are, are really required to enable all those frontline uh, medical professionals to provide the care that's needed. Yeah. A good insight, uh, Steve. I think, um, I mean, large organization, even small organizations, and, uh, you know, uh, even governments, they should, you know, uh, 
adopt these models and you know because this is a tough time and we have to come out of uh, this particular pandemic so yeah good to know about it mm -hmm. and uh, i mean although we have discussed about uh, what's happening in europe india and what models uh, can be successful uh, mark i would like to know uh, from you that now uh, the curve has flattened and uh, people are going more people are going home so what are the learnings uh, i mean other countries can you know uh, uh, adopt what what are your thoughts on it how can uh, we learn from belgium or europe in terms of uh, some good things you did in i mean you guys did in europe or belgium that's a that's a good question um uh, actually i've been thinking about that uh, a few times because uh, yesterday we had a, a meeting with our board of directors and so every month we keep them informed of what's going on and this was exactly also a question of one of the board members on, on which lessons can we learn because uh, like Churchill said I never waste a good crisis so uh, what are the good lessons I think there are some you can see this at the what I would call a more macro level and then a meso and a micro level in a in terms of, the, of our country. So on the government level, you must know that typically for Belgium, uh, which has a very complex governance with several layers of competencies between the federal government and the regional governments, what has come clear uh, from this uh, epidemic is that in, in, case, in times of crisis like we have seen, you need a single line of command and a single line of uh, execution and a single line of communication. And uh, our government has done that, and which was quite, um, uh, I was posit positively um, amazed by the fact that even after a few days, there was this kind of national um, crisis cell, if you want, a national advisory committee, which was advised by scientists, by virologists, epidemiologists, um, clinicians, and they advised the politicians in terms of what is uh, what is uh, useful, what is not useful. And especially in the first weeks of the crisis, uh, it was very well clear that all the, the, uh, the guidelines which were issued by the government were actually based on facts and on data that the scientists gave to the politicians. And this was positively new to me because in, in normal times, policies are based on opinions and ideologies and not so much on facts. And now for the first time you have this almost scientific um, um, uh, paradigm that came out of the, of the government. However, I'm maybe a little bit too optimistic now because after a few weeks when things are cooling down, then you see coming back to all uh, to the back to the top from the from the bottom you see the lobbyist groups and the politicians starting to become nervous again because okay they have to be re-elected etc etc so this was the first take-home message in in times of crisis you need this um, single line of command and we have translated that also in our hospital where we also had a way of doing things with a certain governance of the hospital with all kinds of committees, etc. And now for the first time, uh, I have seen uh, that all 3,800 people working in our hospital were very quickly aligned towards a single dot at the horizon. And that, and that was, we, we didn't want to have Wuhan and Bergamo situations in our hospital where you have patients in the corridors and, and patients dying, uh, etc. And um, we have transformed the hospital uh, in a way that I've never seen before. And it, it, we succeeded. And most of the hospitals, we have about 100 hospitals in Belgium, have succeeded that. And my point to the, to the because I saw our health minister uh, last weekend, and I told her uh, the good lesson that we have learned is and the reason why we succeeded as hospitals to do this mm -hmm. is that we um, uh, really took the same way of governance is this single line of command and this single very uh, strict, um, it's almost like an army if you want. Uh, uh, and and I, we used the quote of um, 
this advisor of the WHO, I forgot uh, the name now, who said, uh, perfection is the enemy of the good in crisis. You have mm -hmm. to take decisions. And you make mistakes then, but that is not, that's not a problem you can correct while doing them, but you have to act. And if we would have used the same um, paradigm that we al always used of discussion and rebuttals and negotiations, <clears throat> then we would have had major, major problems. So um, speed trumps perfection in this. And um, that was a major take home message for me. And also uh, something that I think is a, a good, uh, a good take home message is that this crisis has uh, was a, an, an incredible lever for digit, digitalization of our hospital. We, we have switched to teleconsultations within a few days for our non-COVID patients, which were not uh, allowed to come to the hospital anymore. We have dis been discussing this for five years with the government and it was always blah, blah, blah. And there was always some reason not to do it. And now after one week, we did it as a country and it was allowed, it was regulated, it was reimbursed. Uh, the same for um, teleworking for uh, and non care workers could work from home. And we have created um, a, a teleworking platform for uh, 1200 collaborators. And so we did it overnight. So our IT department has really done a tremendous job in providing us with platforms, with solutions, and it has really speed up things. Mm -hmm. And always with the same thing in mind, uh, perfection is the enemy of the good. Eh? We wanted to have a platform, but it's not perfect, but it works and we use it and we will continue using it. So some good things came out of this uh, crisis also. And uh, these are for me the, and the third thing is uh, maybe the most important um, is uh, people. Uh, I have seen that we have a tremendous reservoir of competencies and talents in our hospital. We have seen, uh, we had to double our ICU capacity, for instance, overnight, but you cannot double the number of ICU nurses and doctors overnight. Mm -hmm. So we gave crash courses to uh, the younger physicians who had uh, still their training in their heads. We have done crash courses uh, for uh, OR nurses, for uh, uh, post-operative care unit nurses, etc. And uh, so this was, and we, we assembled new teams on new places in the hospital with new equipment. And all this was done within a week. And I must say, I was so happy and so positively amazed about the resilience and um, the flexibility of the people, uh, which in normal times I have never seen. Yeah, I think you very rightly said that this is a, a kind of a situation like a war and in war, uh, you know, single line of command is very important, really very important. And coming now key, I mean, communication is the key here. Yeah. If one miscommunication and there is a huge panic, confusion, so I agree with you. And secondly, I think technology acceptance has increased. Earlier, a lot of doctors, they don't want to adopt uh, teleconsultation as a technology, but they have also started, you know, adopting teleconsultation uh, as a, you know, their practice. Yeah, uh, good points, uh, Mark. I'll come to you, Dr. Trehan. Uh, Dr. Trehan, you know that we are a country of 1.3 billion people. We have other healthcare challenges in terms of accessibility and affordability. But when it comes to uh, fighting against COVID-19, we are doing good. I mean, as uh, you, we both agree that yes, we are doing good. So can we secure some brownie points here? I know we started the lockdown very early on. And uh, so what are the learnings here for others? What can others learn from us in terms of learning? So, so basically, I, I would not celebrate as much as you you have expressed. Yeah. I think the, the battle is just beginning. Yeah. As much of a feel-good factor, we may say, happened because of the lockdown, it had some very, very bad consequences also. Not for us personally, but for, for the poor people who were out on the street. I mean, any time you see them, you just, you just have to break down. There's no question. So there has been a huge price paid by a certain segment of our society. But at 
the same time, I think that that could be forgotten if we actually, this lockdown, delivered the promise. So like I said, one clear advantage has been that the chain was somewhat broken. The progression has been slowed down tremendously, which is big advantage. So we can, we can get satisfaction out of that. Yeah. Congratulations, I'll hold for another six weeks. Yeah. If this has helped to flatten the curve, yeah. I mean, that it would be such an amazing feeling to get. True. That said, because of the 1.3 billion people, yeah. the dangers lurking for us and with limited resources is huge. Yeah. But, I, you know, on the other hand, and I would like my co-panelists to also comment on that because right now we say there is no magic bullet. We know that it's a people's war. I mean, we are the we are the army. We are the frontier guys, but the, yeah. it's, the, it's the people's war. Yeah. So are we saying that three principles that we talk about of hygiene, hand hygiene, yeah. masking, and distancing are the only weapons we have on our hands right now to actually continue, try to contain it and flatten the curve. Yeah. Okay. We have been gone blue in the face, day and night. We all the doctors, not only me, we are on TV, TV channels are full of this whole thing. We, I think it's, it's, the repetition is, has gone to a level of ridiculousness, but that's what's required, so it's okay. Yeah. If that be the weapon, and my co-panelists and you agree, and we have been studying some of the, like the Czechoslovakian experience. I'd like to know from, say, Belgium, when did you actually uh, introduce the absolute concept of 100% masking? Because there was some confusion in the early days. Yeah. Is it going to help or not help? And it's going to consume all the surgical masks. The surgeons will not have any masks. I mean, there were all sorts of excuses given in the beginning. But my feeling from day one has been, if it does no harm, yeah. then why not use it? Maybe it'll help. Absolutely. Absolutely. True. It does no harm. You make a three-layer three, three layer mask at home and yeah. get three of them and it's not, it's not even expensive. So anyway, that's one question I'll reserve for my friends. The second thing is that, like we said, we're all grabbing, grabbing at straws. Okay. We thought maybe high temperatures will help. And I don't know. So far, there is not no great evidence. BCG, we talked about. The fact about the fact that we are actually living in a very challenging, toxic environment in India in most places, is our immunity better? The demographic uh, dividend of the young population is a factor. Then we say, okay, BCG, as I said, we have thrown in already. And then we say, look, hydroxychloroquine, has it any, that's another question I want to ask my friends. Is it because even today, I mean, we know that it has no role in prophylaxis. Not, you know, thank God we don't have Trump as our president. But we are still using it in, in therapy in the sense of in early stage. Then we have the promise of remdesivir coming down and some of the other may, uh, drugs that are being repurposed. Plasma therapy, because you you so so if I if I may uh, my professor from Belgium if I can ask you in your experience going down this line, what were your your learning from from these three four things, including ECMO, including uh, the were you using remdesivir were you in the trial in rem remdesivir or not, and some of the other drugs you may have actually used and what is your view on vaccine both of you that's a lot of a lot of questions <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, in terms of uh, drug treatment um, we uh, we have uh, we do not longer use uh, hydroxychloroquine or remdesivir except for in trial uh, situations and there are trials uh, on the way but the preliminary data that we have 
at least for, for uh, hydroxychloroquine was that if it does something, it has to be given very early in the disease and not in people um, who are already sick for a week, 10 days, and then are admitted in ICU, etc. then it's too late. So mm -hmm. if probably the idea is that if it does something, it, it has to be given quite early in the early stage of the diseases. The BCG uh, issue is also uh, here on the agenda in that it might give an, uh, a general boost to the immune system, uh, but is also under scrutiny. The same goes for plasma of um, uh, convalescent uh, patients, male patients are now called in in the blood transfusion units to give plasma. And a huge trial is, uh, is going on for the moment uh, by, by uh, giving uh, uh, convalescent plasma to, to patients. But it's in trial. It's, we, we don't have the results yet. So it's, mm -hmm. it's, there's a lot of scientific scrutiny going on at the same time. And I think every patient that we have is in at least two or three trials for the moment at the same time, also in imaging, etc., uh, and other, um, other trials. Uh, as to the mask thing, uh, this has been a, a point of discussion here in Belgium. And I think it was mainly driven by the fact that we didn't have enough masks. And uh, there was this conflicting uh, evidence, but uh, now at least uh, it is uh, compulsory to, uh, to wear a mask if you go into public transport or in uh, shops, etc., where there is a risk of crowding, etc. Everybody wears a mask. And I think... Uh, we probably should have done this earlier. And I refer to some countries in the Far East where they are much more um, prepared between brackets for outbreaks of SARS, etc., And where it is lot, much more normal to wear masks in public uh, situations. So I think this will be an element of the new normal as long as we don't have an efficacious uh, vaccine uh, that is available uh, on, a global, uh, on a global scale. Uh, we should probably follow these uh, these instructions for the next few years. And as to the vaccine, um, I am actually not so optimistic that we would have an, a vaccine which is at the same time uh, fully protective and uh, available for the global, uh, for the billions of peoples on the planet. Knowing the production capacity of the of the vaccine industry, it will take probably three to four years to to make enough doses, if, if we find one vaccine, which is already still a, a question mark, because if I understand, um, I've, I've had a, a webinar with uh, the former CEO of uh, GSK vaccines, which are situated here in, in Brussels. Mm -hmm. And um, he was very, um, well, not, not negative, but of, or pessimistic, but he, he explained the challenges, the challenges that are lying ahead in that there are several ways or, or um, pathophysiological ways to conceive a vaccine. You can work on proteins, you can work on RNA, you can work on attenuated viruses, etc. Uh, so there is not uh, conclusive uh, evidence yet on which way to go, or maybe it should be a combination of vaccines. It's still not clear. But what struck me and what I didn't know actually was that the, the, the manufacturing capacity of the vaccine industry, if you add all the production sites, which are, if mm. they would switch 100% to coronavirus uh, vaccine production, it would take three to four years to make enough vaccine for the global population. So I, and his prediction was that then the trouble will start. The moment you will start production, who will get the vaccine first? Yeah. Is it the one with the, the, the biggest uh, leap of dollars or the, the one with, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, and there the battle will begin. And um, mm. I, was, I was quite uh, impressed by his, uh, by his statements. Uh, so we haven't solved that issue yet. So Naveen, can I interrupt here and ask Mark his model for yeah. India going yeah. forward? Because that would be very significant. Yeah. Uh, Steve, uh, you mean Steve? Steve sorry, Steve? Not Mark, sorry. Thank you, Mark. But yeah. on to Steve. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So, a very, very interesting discussion, and, and you've raised uh, several, uh, I think, powerful points. Um, one of those was speed. And even if the model's not exactly right, 
uh, if we have a useful model, even if we can't estimate all the parameters exactly, if over a range of parameters, we're gonna come up with the same decision. In other words, our, our decision is robust and insensitive to some of the assumptions about the model, we can make progress. For example, we can try to estimate R0 R all we want or R0 you know, transmission between subpopulations all we want. But as long as we're able to get R0 under 0.9, <laughs> we're gonna be doing a good thing. And so we don't have to argue about what's exactly the right model, what's exactly the right parameter estimate, if we can improve the probability that we're gonna be having R0 under 0.9. And the masks, I think is a very good example. We're not sure if it's going to protect somebody who's susceptible from somebody who's infectious or not, but the error of getting it wrong is, is not symmetric uh, one way or the other. Same thing if somebody's infected, does it reduce the infectivity of that person towards others who might be at risk? So if there's a chance, and if there's a supply chain that keeps our healthcare workers protected, and it's inexpensive to provide some level of reduction, it can only help us get that R0 below 0.9. Similarly, around capacity models, you know, we were working with uh, our, our good friends at University Medical Center in Amsterdam at the, the AMC location. Uh, we've had a collaboration for several years uh, with their intensive care unit, with their infectious disease unit around sepsis diagnosis and treatment. And we had just done some work with them around trying to evaluate you know, bed capacity for different degrees of specialisms within their hospital. Do they have a big general ICU? Do they have an ICU? Um, you know, particularly for medical, for surgical, for, you know, for various subspecialties, and just looking at some of the trade-offs around the operating characteristics there. Unfortunately, that model had just been done right at the time when uh, the, the, the curve was going up. So we adapted that quickly to model, uh, you know, what, what is good bed sizing for, for uh, COVID bed expansion plans. Uh, as, as so many institutions have done or, or, or are about to do. Um, and it, just a super simple model, but it, it just gave people some insights to how to expand. And it was very neat to see some of, some of the colleagues of, of Dr. Naveen um, in the, the IHT network uh, uh, making good use of, of, of some of those models as they're considering their expansion plans. So I think robustness of the decision is important. Um, the physical capacity, I couldn't agree more. Uh, Mark, you were mentioning around the vaccine uh, capacity. I think that leaves us with some very interesting challenges uh, as we move forward. We may have a second rebound of this COVID as more and more countries uh, relax uh, the, the restrictions on social distancing. That may pop up and a number of people are, are indicating that. I think what we need to do is we need to be prepared for multiple scenarios. And we need to be prepared now. And uh, we don't know exactly whether or not we're going to have a big second bump, whether things are going to uh, phase out. But if we keep our eyes and are prepared now for any of those scenarios and adapt, um, you know, maybe you can expend the beds, but you can't, you know, expand the capacity of doctors and nurses immediately who have that specialism. Well, maybe we need to be starting thinking about that now. Same thing for vaccine supply capacity or antiviral or what, whatever that intervention might be. Um, and we do have lessons we can learn from the past. If we think about uh, the avian flu scare, uh, the swine flu, uh, antivirals was a, was a big issue there. And one of the um, antiviral manufacturers actually developed a supply chain so that it could ramp up its production by a factor of 15 or more. Uh, and it's a virtual capacity. And so what that means is that for supply chains to be able to ramp up and adapt to that, there has to be unused capacity in the background, or there have to be real options between the front end pharma and potential supplier firms. We have to look back into the supply chain, see, is there capacity which can be adapted over to potential new treatments if we need to produce them? And how do we set up those relationships? How do we align incentives so that if we do 
get that vaccine, if we do get that antiviral that works, that we're able to, uh, to, to use that hammer in full force. And that's something we need to think about preparing for now. And that's about setting partnerships. It's about collaborations. And it's about communicating along each of these supply chains, how can we get make them effective should any of these different scenarios arise? Maybe we need a lot, maybe we don't need a lot, but let's be prepared. Yeah. Um, I think some of some of the tools that have been used in supply chain management that might be effective, and I think that might be helpful here, even in the healthcare uh, uh, delivery side, as well as in the supply chains for the PPE, for the masks, for the vents, and so forth. And that is mapping out who, where do you get your supply from, whether it's the supply of cloth for masks or plastics, whether it's uh, electronics equipment for some other uh, electrical controlling equipment, whether it's how are you going to find the uh, medical personnel to step up if we need to ramp up our ICU capacity again? How, where does that flexibility come from? Those are things that we can be thinking about now. And as we look at that, we can then look to see what are the secondary effects. If we bring in the emergency room doctors to support in the intensive care, if we're using a particular uh, manufacturing plant to produce this particular antiviral instead of that other product, what is the indirect effect going to be on that other condition that, that's no longer being treated in the same way? If we start to make those plans now, we can start to develop a more robust supply chain so that we can extend the amount of time till we run dry. You know, if there's a node that goes down in that supply chain, there's a certain amount of time until the end customer is no longer able to get what they need. Yeah, no, that's exactly what that. we are actually going through. We are going yeah. through that whole exercise right now. Yeah. Especially, you know, it applies not only to the medical emergency, it also applies to bringing back to life certain things exactly that were, uh, pushed off the, uh, the pushed off the edge now we're going to bring back you know how like the supply chain modeling that you talked about is fantastic you're right mm -hmm. and i think that's what we you you know naveen people like you are the ones who can add the brain power there uh, <laughs> one more question which i may throw since we have the, the opportunity to have you uh, such uh, you on the line is that and Naveen, maybe you should look at it. In the past, we have talked about doctors without borders going and intervening or assisting or helping, whatever, in yeah. the past. Yeah. Even in Ebola, you know, when Africa had nothing that yeah. a lot of things were put down. Has there been any examples of this being ha this happening right now? Because the rest of the world, a large no number of people or countries are actually on the downswing. Yeah. Now, if it pops up his head in a country like India where there may be acute shortages, should we be entertaining the idea that there are experienced physicians, technicians, nurses around the world, and maybe you can get help. I mean, I hope it, we don't need it, but if somebody needs it, like, like, uh, like locally, what happened in New York, New Jersey and Connecticut helped because it was totally overrun, the medical profession or, or the entire medical fraternity was overrun by, yeah. by by the virus. So anyway, these are some of the thoughts that are very important that we got. <clears throat> but uh, like I was, I was just wanting to push Steve just for one more minute, Steve. So what, uh, what are you predicting for India? One sentence. Yeah. Uh, I'm playing Naveen's role, but I'm very yeah. curious. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. I'm happy for that. Mm. Huh. So, for so India Pacific, I, I wouldn't claim to be uh, adequately informed uh, about the what the situation that's on the ground. Um, but I, I, what I would, what I could suggest though is that we take a look at the data. We try to do our best to get that information and be prepared. I know a, a number of people in a number of countries are just uh, overburdened right now. Um, it's hitting hard. The data is not always showing up in the statistics that we see uh, uh, in the Johns Hopkins and some of the other websites. Um, and I think, um, you know, being sensitive to those, those issues, trying to support where we can, we've got to ride this out. Uh, and I guess my strong uh, take home, I guess, from this would be 
uh, we're not through it yet. Um, let's try to use these medical principles, public health and epidemiological principles, and supply chain principles to make sure that we're prepared in case we get a big bounce coming up. Is, the is, there, a, is there a questionnaire, one pager that you can, you can say, send us and say, look, fill in the facts here and I may be able to give you an idea or give you some suggestions? Yeah, there's, there's you know, a, I'm a surgeon. I always like to look for an end result of, a, of any engagement. And I'm yeah. looking for there, there's a very interesting article about um, how the SARS outbreak was handled in, in uh, Singapore and Toronto. That's something that's been published already. I can try to try to fish that uh, reference out for you. So, Naveen, can you try to get that and let's share it? Because we should, yeah. you know oh, what? Definitely, I, no, definitely. I will yeah. get it from Steve and share it with you. Yeah, what Mark was saying earlier, that a plural system became one command Yeah. this battle, yeah. right? We are suffering from that right now, actually. Absolutely. Because the federalism here also, and every state has their own idea. Yeah. It's not bad because they also have their peculiar needs. It's not a homogeneous country. It's a, yeah. it's a, it's a very diverse country. So we have, a, every state has its own problem, but there is a lost in translation, as we say, yeah. from yeah. the central recommendations or protocols to, to the guy on the ground who's administering it. There's been a lot of problems, but anyway, not surmount unsurmountable. But what I'm saying is that given where we are and given that we are on a very wobbly scaffolding, it may not collapse if the burden is not that huge, but it, it will be, a, a, you know, a big problem for us. So maybe this kind of international thinking of get, trying to hook up on a more, you know, what we are doing today? We get an expert on the other side, put them on the TV, ask them two, three questions, and nothing comes out of it. But what you have done today is very meaningful. Very meaningful to whoever is listening that you have a focused thing coming out of it to say concrete effects of we are the we are the trailers, we are trailing behind them. Yeah. So we should be able to use the information that we got. But you can play a very, very uh, I can say uh, stimulating or uh, I'm lost for that word. But anyway, you could be playing a catalyst is the word in this whole effort to try to tie up everything in a man meaningful manner rather than just talking heads. Yeah, That's what so, my opinion is. Yeah. So I agree with you, Dr. Drehan. It is good to have an international pool of all these you know, medical resources. And then, um, I mean, we use that. And I agree with you on that. So. Uh, I think we are almost, uh, I'm taking over from you, Dr. Trehan. We are <laughs> almost. <laughs> I have a habit. You know, yeah. No, thank you. Thank you. I like that. So this we are right. almost at the end of the session, but but before I'm, we. I'm yeah. not sitting in those beautiful chairs being, you know, academically brilliant. I'm, I'm a worker, so. <laughs> no, I understand, sir. So, and I appreciate uh, for that, sir. So, before we end, I want I want you guys to answer. Uh, there are a couple of questions, but we will pick only one or two uh, because we have to respect time as well. So, there is one question from Jagruti Bhatia. Since this is a human war, and the primary focus is to cure, do do you will feel that alternative medicine, which is very strong in India, like homeopathy, Ayurveda, pranayam, uh, uh, homotherapy indicated in Vedas. Uh, I mean, uh, do you find any relevance with these therapies, sir? So I guess that's for me. I they, think, yeah, yeah, Most definitely, most definitely, look this up because in all these webinars, people keep asking you similar questions. What do you do? First of all, people are getting cabin fever, right? The other thing is what people are worried about is that we hear it's all immunity, immunity, immunity. What do we do? Yeah. So all the things you met, mentioned about yoga and the asanas of yoga, like Surya Namaskar, yeah. if you, you can do it in a six by six room. Absolutely. You yeah. don't need to have a, an elaborate uh, place. If you can build up to 30 Surya Namaskars a day, your your every part of your body is stretched every muscle 
has been exercised and that's the best you can do for your immunity. For your sanity, all the uh, uh, breathing exercises of pranayam will help you hugely. I mean, I've been using it for 33 years myself, uh, the pranayam. But I'm saying at this time, it is even more important. Yeah. Okay, now let me come to the to the pharmaceuticals of it. So we have four trials going on right now in Medanta yeah. using a, a combination of Ayurvedic herbal remedies along with whatever antivirals we are trying right now. So these are four trials going on, not enough recruitment yet. Hopefully, I, mean, I hope we never get that many patients, but if we do, we will have the study finished in four weeks in the sense that the, the recruitment is small numbers, 50 in each. Uh, so it's a, uh, there's a lot going on right now. So this answer, I'm dying to, because I'm a believer, I have an Ayurvedic hospital inside my hospital. In Medanta, we have an Ayurvedic hospital. So I want to actually explore the possibility of those synergies and it's, uh, it's thrown us together as an emergency now. Things that we used to, like uh, Mark was saying, Telemedicine, which was five five years in talking, it happened in one week. Same thing happened here. I've been five years in talking for, about Ayurvedic combination, and it's happened just in, in one week. So, anyway, I know you're going to cut us off soon, but it is great knowing both of you. It is a real pleasure. If you ever come to India, and I hope you will, please be my guest. Thank you. And, uh, it's a big pleasure. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, I think we had a fantastic discussion. With that, we come to the end of the session. On behalf of Voice of Healthcare and the audience, I would like to thank Dr. Naresh Trehan, Steve, Mark. Thank you very much for being on this panel. Stay safe. Bye bye. Corona Namaste. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank, you. Bye. thank you. Thank you very Stay much. Stay healthy. Bye. bye. Okay. Bye -bye. Absolutely.